technical hitch. I've been a bit distracted lately um, with whether I have a home to go to. Uh, but um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, observations in the Southwest Indian Ocean. I'm not as prepared as I'd hoped to be, so bear with me. Um, but I hate to give a talk that doesn't have some science in it. Um, so uh, just to give you um, a little background on uh, what's so interesting about the subtropics um, and the Southwest Indian Ocean. Uh, so this is a picture from Megan Cronin. Um, I can find the pointer. Uh, where you'll see that um, the Agulhas region and uh, the Agulhas return current, uh, and indeed large swaths of the subtropical gyre, are regions where um, there's heat transport, heat flux from the ocean into the atmosphere. Um, we've already seen this figure, uh, which has actually been updated by Monica Ryan, I think, uh, globally. But um, in terms of uh, Indian Ocean heat content, um, there's uh, uh, massive increase in, in the Indian Ocean heat content, particularly in the southern Indian Ocean. Um, and this has been related um, to a number of things, including maybe an increase in the Indonesian through flow. Um, also, you'll see this is a picture um, that I made from the HAD1 SST data set. And it's basically the sea surface temperature trend minus the global trend. So where you see blue doesn't mean the sea surface is getting cooler. It just means that it's, uh, it's warming at a slightly less rate than the global trend here. And where it's red and yellow, that's where it's warming two or three times the rate um, of the global sea surface temperature. And you can see uh, how the regions of western boundary currents, basically, not just in the Indian Ocean, but also the Gulf Stream, Brazil current, and so on, um, are regions of re really dramatic change. Um, and you know some of this warming throughout the South Indian Ocean has been attributed also to changes in westerlies, um, as well as perhaps uh, intensifying and shifting of these western boundary current systems. Um, it's also uh, a region where we have overturning, um, which is um, uh, diffusively driven, the Indian and the Pacific um, basins. And this is something that, that Lynn Talley talks about um, in several um, of, of her uh, very good papers. Here's, here's a picture from 2013. One of her papers in which she reminds us that um, the overturning of thermohaline circulations in the Indian and the Pacific Oceans are very much um, strong and part of uh, how we set um, our water properties, for example, in the Southern Ocean, even though the winds are an important part of how these, uh, how these, how these, how these waters up well. Um, this is another picture that speaks to that. You'll see this dotted line way over here. That's the Indian Ocean Basin. That's the diffusive fluxes in the Indian Ocean Basin estimated from one of these bulk estimates from a basin-wide section, in fact. This comes from the global um, uh, inverse by Lumpkin and Spear in 2007. And this is another picture from their same paper, which shows you that the meridional heat transport, uh, the oceanic heat transport coming out of the Indian Ocean subtropics, 1.55 petawatts. That's larger even than the transport in the North Atlantic, okay, which we've been measuring now since 2004. And this heat transport is basically balancing heat loss across the Southern Ocean and the Atlantic. Um, so it's, it's, there's a massive amount of heat uh, in the Indian Ocean, and, and, and this amount of heat has been growing disproportionately over the last, uh, over the last decade. This is a picture from Hanatel, where she shows that a lot of the, um, the variance of heat uh, of SST across the Indian Ocean looks very different from, say, um, the, the kind of meridional um, modal variability that you get in the Pacific with the IPO. Um, it's kind of this basin-wide um, mode. And so the question is, um, what can we do in the subtropics and the southwest Indian Ocean to improve our observations? What, what are we doing? What does exist? And what might we do in the future to improve our understanding of some of these, some of these mechanisms? Um, this is an example of how variability on the left here, this is an example of how variability in the tropics uh, and the subtropics and from the Pacific affects, this is through um, you know, correlation pathways, um, some work I did with Chanel Apo, how that affects the region uh, in the southwest and in variability in the Agulhas current itself. Um, these kind of anomalies propagate across um, with um, 
with lags of a few years. Uh, and this on the right is an example um, of some work I've been doing uh, with um, Agola's current data. We built uh, a long-term proxy using sea level and in situ data from this region here. Um, and we found that um, despite those large SST increases and despite the increases in the westerlies, there doesn't appear to be any strengthening of this western boundary current system. So that warming doesn't appear to be in, uh, related to an intensification of the boundary current. And instead what we found, this is the sea level slope trend here. So it's negative um, across the center of the current. The, uh, the core of the current is about 50 kilometers offshore. It's marked by this line here. And you can see that basically the trend in the, in the, in the gradient of sea level is negative such that the current is weakening on its onshore flank, and it's positive its offshore flank such that the current is strengthening. And what that basically means is that the current is um, getting broader over time. And the question is why, and it may be related to trends in eddy-kinetic energy. If you look at the yellow line here, this is eddy-kinetic energy, a positive trend across the whole of the current uh, from the coast offshore uh, with a decrease in the mean kinetic energy. So this current is getting more turbulent um, and that could be why it's getting broader, and that could be a response to these changes in the climate system, which is quite different, for example, from what IPCC models are showing. Um, so lots of interesting uh, science to get at. Um, so in the Agolas current itself, uh, this is what, what I've been involved with um, the most. The Agolas system climate array is now something that we put in the water in 2016. Um, the uh, the um, hope is that it's going to be a long-term sustained element of the Indian Ocean Observing System. It is led by South Africa, uh, the US, my group in Miami, and I put the Dutch in brackets because um, they've had uh, funding issues. Um, but they used to be a long-term, uh, some of you might remember there used to be long-term moorings in the Mozambique Channel and they came out a couple of years ago. That's about a 10-year record, which is available online. It's called LOCO, L-O-C-O. Um, and basically, uh, they gave us some instruments to put uh, in this array. The South Africans are, are giving all the ship time, um, and we're due to go back out in February 2018 and change this array around. We have like two more cruises funded, and then we'll be looking to try to sustain these observations uh, with long-term funding. The array is large. Uh, it's, it consists of seven full depth moorings. You can see the little green squares are microcats, the red squares are current meters. Um, each of the purple um, floats here has upward looking ADCPs. Um, the first array that I had was just velocity. This array is now temperature and salinity also, so we could really try to, try to get at the heat, the heat transports. Um, just as kind of an aside, um, in terms of Southwest Indian Ocean Research and IOE2, um, these are things from the, from the South African community, um, which is a community that I, that I know well. Um, and so they gave, gave me some details. This, this uh, uh, African Cedarcanth um, ecosystem project, uh, which has been going since 2015. It'll be going until 2018. Uh, they have cruises um, a couple of times a year in the Indian Ocean off the east coast of South Africa. And this is their IOE2 um, cruise. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be taking their icebreaker, actually, up north um, off the coast of Mozambique, Tanzania, uh, Kenya, um, and also doing some transects over the shelf and doing, uh, as Raleigh said, a lot of ecosystem um, kinds of measurements on that. And that'll be over the time period of October, November this year. Uh, on the eastern side of the subtropics, um, there is the Lewin current. Lewin current is rather weak. Uh, it's only uh, three to five sphere drops, and it flows um, south, rather also um, uniquely for a subtropical gyre because of the Indonesian through flow. Um, there are, have been measurements made by IMOS through Australia since 2008. And uh, this is just showing some of the moorings in that region. There are also gliders and coastal radar going out regularly. And they have BGC sensors. Um, they have, basically, they have a really nice integrated observing system uh, that's ongoing on that side of the basin. 
I think Lynn's going to touch on, on, on ghost ship, and Mike already did, but just for Southern Indian Ocean, um, I kind of grabbed, you know, next up in 2019, there are all these sections around the South Indian Ocean uh, uh, coming up during that time frame. And then moving forward in time, if we want to try to capture uh, some of these dynamics, um, particularly to do with um, heat transport, uh, heat content in the basin, um, then I would argue that we really need to start to be able to measure uh, how the, the heat flux here um, is changing over time. And uh, you, can, you can do that with the Agullis array. Of course, the Agullis current is a large component um, of, of the heat flux uh, changes in the Indian Ocean and the overturning. Um, you would need some kind of, uh, I've called it an IMO, uh, meridian overturning mooring in the east, some kind of endpoint mooring, um, hydro hydrographic endpoint mooring, which, which could be with sea pies. Um, we're hoping the Australians might support. And then you would need deep Argo, because in the Indian Ocean, the overturning is deep. It's Antarctic bottom water going in. Um, there's a lot of variability that I haven't even touched on in the thermocline, the mode waters. Um, uh, on decadal timescales, uh, there's questions about um, where the, when the, I think it's less, less clear in the Indian Ocean where the interface of the overturning circulation is, 2,000 meters, 3,000 meters. Um, so deep Argo is, would be a really important element um, of that. Uh, some recent work um, by Italian co-authors points to uh, perhaps this overturning circulation is weakening over time. Uh, perhaps somewhat related to reduction in Antarctic bottom water formation, for example. Um, but it's really not clear uh, on any other timescales um, what the variability of this, of this flux is. Um, and I think it's something important for us to consider moving forward. Thank you. <laughs>